excited to be continuing our series all in. And we've been talking about what it means to be all in for God, to be committed to God. And so we talked a few weeks ago just generally about like what, what does it mean for us to go all in. And then last week, PV talked about some of the barriers that are holding us back to being all in for God. And then this week, we're going to talk about like what's our goal? Like what are we going all in for and how do we get there and how does that change us? And as we think about this idea of going all in, I was thinking about going to the pool. Do you guys like going to the pool? Anybody? Yes. Our family loves going to the pool. And if you ever go to the pool, uh, you know, you get all your stuff ready, right? So you've got your towel and you're ready to, to go and you throw your towel over your shoulder and you got your sunscreen and you put your sunscreen on and then you get your goggles and you take them and you, you put your goggles on. And you're ready to go, right? You're ready to go to the pool. And then you get to the pool, and you show up, and you, and you get to the edge of the pool, and, and then you, you're like, okay, I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. And so you kind of like dip your toe in, and you're like, okay, is it warm? Is it cold? What, like, what's this going to be like? And then maybe uh, you, you say, okay, I feel good about that. I dipped my toe in. I'm going to put my foot in, and I'm just going to step right here, and then I'm going to wait and see how it goes for a minute. And then, and then I take another step, and then I wade out deeper and deeper. And we take these, these small steps, kind of like inching our way into the pool. And then there's other people, and they get to the pool, and they don't do any of that. They just come, and they go, woo, and they cannonball right into the pool. They jump all in right away. And as we think about what it means for our faith, what it means to be with God, I want us to think about what it means for us to jump all in, to just, uh, to just go for it, to dive into Jesus and what he means for our Lives. We want to jump in to what he is doing but for us and through us and with us. And so I'm going to pray this morning and then we're going to talk about what does that mean? What are we diving into? What are we jumping into? And how does that change us and shape us and mold us? So Father God, we love you and uh, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your incredible grace, your incredible love. We thank you that, that you are worth jumping into, that you are worth going all in for. God, I pray for everyone here this morning that you would uh, be with us, that your presence would fill this place, that we would be aware of what your presence is doing, what your spirit is trying to speak to us. Help us to have the courage, the faith to go all in for you. And most of all, thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his incredible name that we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Uh, so when I was in college, um, <clears throat> I started drinking a lot of Dr. Pepper. Uh, I don't really know how this started, but I just like had some Dr. Pepper and I was like, hey, that's pretty good. And then I, I started having more and more. And then I got to the point in my life where I just pretty much only drank Dr. Pepper, right? Like I didn't drink water. I didn't drink any of that. I just drank Dr. Pepper all the time. And I was obsessed with it. I had it uh, like every single day. And I went to college in Ohio, which is different than Texas. It's not quite as popular there. So here it's more normal to be obsessed with Dr. Pepper. But there I was like a weirdo. Everybody was like, you're the, you're the Dr. Pepper guy, right? Like you're obsessed with Dr. Pepper. And like people would, would buy me Dr. Pepper gifts, like t-shirts and, and send me pictures of Dr. Pepper. They'd be like, hey, look, I saw Dr. Pepper. And, and it was just this thing that like I, I, for whatever reason, I just became obsessed with. And I went all in for Dr. Pepper. Like that was what I was all about. And I think so many of us do this in small ways in our lives all the time, where we find something that we like, and we say, I'm going to go all in for that thing. So I don't know, maybe it's like an actor that you like, and you're like, man, I really like them, and so I'm going to see every movie that they are in. Or maybe it's a joke that you hear, and you just are like, I'm going to tell this joke over and over and over again until everyone hates me, because I've told it so many times. And we just go all in on these things, and we think, like, I'm... I love this, I like this, and so I'm going to go all in for it. And we do it in these small ways, but we can also do it in bigger ways, where we can go all in on, on a philosophy or an idea or, or even on a, a church or a pastor or on a, a politician or political party. We could go all in on these things, and we can say, like, that is my thing that I am all about, that I'm going to be defined by, and I'm going to make my life defined by. But the problem with all of those things is that any of the things in this life that we go all in for are eventually going to let us down. That those things that we often go all in for, that they are imperfect, that they are temporary, that they do not last, and they will fail us. And so whatever we go all in on, we want to make sure it's worth going all in on. 
Uh, I've been listening to this podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. It's about Mars Hill Church. I don't know if you're familiar with that church, but it was this church plant that started in Seattle, and it it grew really big, really fast, and it was this huge church that was really influential, and it had this really popular pastor who spoke at conferences, and then over time, as it grew and grew, there came out some things that were unhealthy in the church and things that were not going well, and then all of a sudden... It seemed like out of nowhere, the church just dissolved. The pastor resigned and all of the the churches closed. And and I was listening to this podcast and listening to the stories of these people. And you can just hear it in their voices that they're like, I was all in for this. Like I thought this was the, the church and the pastor. And then that church and that pastor hurt them. And now there's something that they have left behind there. They went all in and got hurt. They got failed by that thing. And that's what happens when we go all in on many of the things in this life, that those things will hurt us. Those things will fail us. But the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Bible, the truth of God is that there is someone, there is something that we can go all in for that is worth it. And that is the person of Jesus, that we can go all in for Jesus and he will never let us down. He will never fail us. And that's uh, the message that I want to bring this morning is that we want to go all in for Jesus. What do we go in, what we're talking about going all in, but what do we go all in for? We go all in for Jesus. And then what happens when we do that? When we go all in for Jesus, where do we go? What is our goal that we are reaching for, striving for, and how do we get there? So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1 mostly uh, this morning. So if you have a Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, I'll give you a minute to get there. This is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a church about things that were going on in their church. And this opening chapter has a lot in it, uh, but I want to kind of focus on this idea of like, what's the goal? What are we striving toward and how do we get there? So Colossians 1, we're going to start at the end. In verse 28, Colossians 1, 28, if you're there, say, I'm all in. in. All right, great. Colossians 1, 28 says, so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us, because we want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. And this is the goal that we are reaching for. The Apostle Paul is saying this is the goal that he strives for in his ministry, to present everyone perfect in their relationship with Christ. And I think that, that, that we need to talk about the word perfect because I think we often think perfect means zero mistakes ever, but that's not really what the Bible means when it says perfect. It's more like mature or complete. Your translation may say that, that we want to be mature in our relationship with Jesus. And, and that's important because it's not, we don't just want to be mature in general, but we want to be mature specifically in our relationship with Jesus. We want to go all in for Jesus. When we say going all in, we don't mean going all in for morality or even like Christianity as an institutionalized religion. We mean going all in for the person of Jesus and a relationship with Jesus. He is the one that we go all in for. And so how do we get there? How do we get to this goal of being mature in our relationship with Jesus? So for that, I want to go back to verses 9 and 10. This is Colossians 1, 9 and 10. It says, So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. And so we see that if our goal is to be mature in Christ, mature in Jesus, how do we get there? The first thing that Paul says is that we want to know God. We have to learn to know Jesus. And as we learn to know Jesus, we can get closer to our goal. It says here that he prays that we would have complete knowledge of his will, this knowledge of what God is doing in the world, and spiritual wisdom and understanding. If we're going to have a mature relationship with Jesus, we have to know him, right? Like this might seem obvious, but in order to have a relationship with someone, you have to know them. You have to know who they are. You have to know what they like and what they don't like, 
Uh, I, I don't know if you guys get a lot of spam calls. Do you guys get a lot of spam calls? I get a lot of spam calls, and I have this like little test, right? So like I know, I, I try to answer it every time, but I know immediately whether or not it's a spam call, and this is how I know. If I answer the phone and I say, hello, and they say, hi, can I speak to Troy? I know that it's a spam call because my name is Troy, but I do not go by Troy. So I know immediately, okay, we do not have a relationship. You do not know that I go by TJ because that is, uh, if you know me, if we have a relationship, then you would know that about me. You would know who I am and how I uh, go, what I go by. Or maybe like what, what you're interested in, right? Like I don't know if you, maybe you're a person who just like really doesn't like sports and everybody's always coming up to you trying to talk about sports like, hey, how was the game last weekend? And you're like, I don't care about that. It's hard to have a relationship with someone if you don't know what they're interested in and if you don't know what they care about. And so it's the same with our spiritual growth with God. We cannot have a relationship with God if we don't know him, if we don't know what he's like, if we don't know how, what his name is, if we don't know how he, what he cares about and what he's interested in. And so we want to learn to know God better and better. And as we do that, it says that we grow in our spiritual wisdom and understanding. And this is important because I think that as we talk about knowledge, it's easy for us to just think like head knowledge, intellectual knowledge. Like I just need to, to learn a bunch of Bible trivia. But that's not what this is talking about. That it's not about Bible trivia, but it's about knowing God personally and knowing what our relationship with God personally, how that plays out in real life. It's practical. Wisdom is practical. How do I live in my relationship with God and in my relationship with other people? How do I live that out? Right after I, I graduated college, I had this job at a customer service company, and I worked in the sales department, not in sales because I would be really bad at that, but I worked as like the administrator of the sales department, and so I did kind of all the behind the scenes stuff. And one of the main things that I did was I kind of handled our like client management software. We had this big software with all of our clients and, and, and the salespeople would like put notes in and, and schedule follow-ups and stuff like that, and so I had to handle all that. And when I learned how to do that, I remember the guy who trained me, he, he said, okay, listen, here's the software, and then here's the website with all the, the training videos, right? You can watch all these training videos, and that'll tell you the information that you need to know. But if you really want to learn this, it's going to be way better and way more efficient and way longer lasting if you just get into the program. Just get in there, start using it, start messing around with it, start trying things. And then as you do that, if you need to go back to the training videos and, and figure stuff out, you can. But I, I, I noticed that that worked, that, that if I had just said, hey, I'm going to watch all these videos and I watched like hours and hours of videos, then when I got to the program, I would have forgotten all of it. But because I was doing it, because I was using it, I learned not just what it was, but actually how it worked and how I could live that out. And that's what spiritual wisdom is. Is this not just, I need, to, I need to learn all these facts about God, but I need to know how God wants me to live, how God wants to change me, how he wants to show me how to live differently. And so I gain spiritual wisdom. I gain knowledge about God as I seek to live that out and follow him every day. And I think that that idea of, of every day is important because one of the other things I noticed about that is that the salespeople didn't know how to use the software. And, and every time, like every couple months, they, they'd come to me and they'd be like, TJ, like, like, how do I do this? I don't understand how to do this. And I'm like, I, I explained this to you like two months ago. Like what, what happened? And what I realized was that they only used it every two months. Yeah. That they were like, okay, I, this is when I have to do it because I have to put in this information because I got my review coming up or whatever. And, and, and yet, and so they, they would just use it every couple months. And because of that, every time they would forget how to use it. And whereas I was in it every day, and so I could do it because I was in it all the time. And sometimes, when it comes to our faith, we think, I'm just going to show up when I feel like it, or when I feel like I have to. I'm just going to pop into the Bible when it, when it suits me. I'm just going to pop into church or into small group when I feel like I have to, because we're kind of at that point where I've been gone too long or whatever. And yet that's not going to give us spiritual wisdom. That's not going to help us grow into mature believers in our relationship with God. If we want that goal, we have to be doing it every day, following God every day, trying to live this out every day because we want to know God. 
And this is why, it, uh, and this is why I think the spiritual disciplines are so important. So we, uh, the church throughout history, has done a few things: has has read and studied and known the Bible, has spent time praying to God, has gathered together as a church, has fasted, and those are practices that we do even when we don't feel like it, because we know that that's going to help us grow in our relationship to God and learn to know Jesus more. Yeah. And so if we want to be mature in our relationship with Jesus, first we have to learn to know Jesus. But the second thing is that we have to grow to live like Jesus. We see in verse 10 that it goes on and it says, if we do those things, then you will live a life that will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. As we learn to know Jesus, then we grow to be more like Jesus in our actions and in the way that we live. Now, now we can be honest here, right? Like, I don't always live in a way that honor and pleases the Lord. I don't always live in a way that produces every kind of good fruit. And we know that, that to some extent that's okay because we are not perfect and we will not be perfect until Jesus comes and remakes all of us and remakes the whole world and gives us a, a brand new life. But I think the problem is, is, is not that we haven't reached the goal, but that some of us have stopped trying to reach the goal. That in some areas of our lives, we've just said, okay, I think, I think I'm close enough. Like, I think I've made it far enough and I, I can kind of be done with that. You know, I, I learned this uh, very clearly recently. Uh, you may have noticed that I have a, a splint on here. Um, and, and I broke my hand about six weeks ago. And that, that's been rough. But honestly, even worse than that has been every single place that I go, people say, oh, man, what happened to your hand? Like, what'd you do to your hand? And I have to be honest, because every time I'm tempted to lie, because the answer is, is kind of embarrassing. Uh, when I, uh, I was having uh, a frustrating time uh, in my life, and I was angry about something, and I went out to my garage to kind of cool off, and in a moment of anger, I punched something in my garage, and I broke my hand right here. And, and that's embarrassing, but it's even worse because I, a part of my story is that I felt like God had helped me overcome anger. That when I was a kid, I was incredibly angry. Like I would yell and throw things and hit things. My, my mom is here this morning. She can vouch for this. I was not good. And thanks to my mom and thanks to scripture, she helped me memorize James 1.19. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And I felt like God used that in me, that verse and, and my mom's influence and just my overall growth in Christ to really heal me of anger. And then I felt like that was behind me. I have conquered that. It is over. And God reminded me, no, you haven't. You are not there yet. You have not reached the goal. There is more growing to do in your life. And that's true of all of us in so many ways. And we can think, you know, I've, I've beaten this, I've arrived, and yet God is reminding us, no, we, we have more growth to do. And I think that sometimes we can, we can stop trying to grow because we think we've made it. I think sometimes we can go the other direction where we think, I know I haven't made it, but I just kind of start to justify like that, like there's that thing that I struggle with, but you know what, that's just, that's just my personality or that's just like the way God made me. I think we can even get real spiritual with this where we can say, oh, you know what, that, that's not my spiritual gift, right? Like, oh, I don't have the spiritual gift of mercy, so I don't have to be kind to people. Or, or I don't have the spiritual gift of generosity, so I don't have to give or, or whatever. And we can start to justify these things in our lives. And yet in this verse, Paul says that God is going to produce every kind of good fruit in our lives. There is no area in which we can just give up and say, you know what, I've, I don't need that. No, every kind of good fruit in our lives, when we go all in for Jesus, he changes us top to bottom, inside out, every which way. He changes everything about our lives. And so we want to work to love God more and live like God more. And we want to be like him and be changed by him. And we want to strive to seek to live like Jesus every day. Yeah. And now I think that this, this can be complicated because as we speak about, you know, I want, to, I want to strive to be more like Jesus. There's this other side of it where we know that striving is not always going to get us there. That there's this fine line walked in scripture where we care deeply about how we live and the things that we do. But we also understand that the answer to that is not just try harder, do better, sin less. That the answer is actually in God himself. Yeah. 
that as we look at this passage, it says, first, we, first God gives us spiritual wisdom, and then we learn how to live differently, that the source is God himself, that God is the one who is teaching us how to live differently and how to live better. And I think this is even more clear at the very end of Colossians chapter 1. The last verse, Colossians 1.29, says this. It says, that's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. So he's saying, I work hard, but I'm depending on God's work. And so it's not my work, it's not me doing better out of just sheer willpower, but it's the work of God in me that is helping me to work and struggle so hard. You know, our, uh, we, we have a, a new baby, he's four months old, and uh, one of the things that he really likes to do right now is to kind of like stand up in my lap, uh, but he's not really standing up because I'm holding him, right? Like I'm just kind of holding him up, and he's got his legs locked, and he's pushing down, and he's, he's struggling. Like you can see, like he's working to hold himself up, but the truth is, if I let go, he's, he's going timber, like he's going down. <laughs> Because it's my power that is holding him up. And it's the same thing with God. It's that it's God's power that holds us up. And so we work and we struggle, but it's the power of God working in us that really gets us to the goal. And he, here's the thing that's interesting about that. Because like with, with our, our baby, it's, it's not his work and his struggle is not what's holding him up. But what his work and his struggle does is it actually makes his legs stronger. And so the work and the struggle that he does is not about holding himself up, but it's about changing him and growing him and making him stronger. And it's the same thing with God, that we work and we struggle, not because like God needs our help to do it, but because it's actually changing us and it's helping us to be stronger and more like Jesus every day. And so we work to uh, follow Jesus and to be more like Jesus and to live more like Jesus. Not because we ever get to the point where we don't need God, but because God wants to change us. And so if we're going to get to this goal of being mature in our relationship with Jesus, to be all in for Jesus, that we need to learn to know Jesus and we need to grow to live like Jesus. And then lastly, I think we need to grow in our relationship with others. We need to grow together with other people. And this is kind of underlying this whole passage because this, this, um, this letter is a letter from Paul to a church. Like it's a group of people together who are worshiping God. And at each point, he's talking about how he's praying for them. He's supporting them. He's ministering to them. And he mentions this other guy, Epaphras. And he's like, he's praying for you. He's ministering to you. And so I think it's important for us to understand that if we're going to go all in for Jesus, we have to go all in with other people, with other Christians who are doing it with us. I want to jump to Ephesians chapter 2. I'll just read this. You don't have to flip there. But in Ephesians chapter 2, it's talking about how, how Jesus has, has brought us together as a church. And it says, Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. As we think about our relationship with God, as we think about our going all in for Jesus, we have to understand that God is building us as a church together in him, that we're going all in for Jesus together in him. I was thinking about that uh, this, this week because uh, we have our, our Verge Teen Ministries kind of like relaunching today and we have a party today. And one of the things that I was responsible for that is I built a gaga pit. So I don't, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's like this this wooden hexagon that, that they play and you hit a ball and whatever. That's not really relevant to this. But, but so it's this, this big wooden thing, right? And I'm building this. And the way that I built it was I had these like wooden panels that slot together. And so you like put one, you slot the other one into it. You put one, you slot that one into it. And, and what I found is that if, if you take just like one panel and sit it right here and let go, it's going to tip over. It's going to fall down. But if you take that panel and you slot it into the next one, now they're holding each other up. And so they're, they're actually staying upright because they are connected to each other. But even those two, it's still wobbly. The wind can still blow it. And it's really only once you connect all six pieces together that it is sturdy and together. And this is a picture of, of the church, of what God is saying here in Ephesians chapter 2, is that God has built us together, and that together we are stronger and sturdier and more solid than on our own. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so God has given us the church to go all in on him together because it says that he's the cornerstone, right? Like he's the, main, he's the first piece that is solid and stuck together and we are all connected together in him. And this is why we think it is so important for us to build relationships with other Christians. One of the things I, I like to say is that spiritual growth happens in relationships, that spiritual growth happens as we, other Christians, support one another, encourage one another, push one another toward Jesus. And this is part of why I think like, like the stuff that we do at church, the programs, the groups ministry, the men's and women's ministry that we do, we don't do that just for fun. We do that because I believe that that is actually helping us grow closer to Jesus. That, that my group this summer, that we met this summer, and I just really felt like we connected and we supported and we grew together with one another. That we were living out the commands of Scripture in, in uh, our group. And that's why we do that. And, and that each week, as I, as I thought about going to our group, every single week, even, even the weeks that like, I didn't really want to do it. I didn't really want because we can be honest, there are weeks when you just are like overwhelmed or you're tired or you're stressed and you just don't want to do it. But even those weeks, I left encouraged. I left feeling like the spirit of God had moved and that these people were building me up together in Jesus. And that's why we do all of this. That's why we, we, we do these things, because we want to build one another up in Jesus. We find people who can support us, who can push us, who can make us more like Jesus. And they give us that, that spiritual wisdom and that understanding. And so these are ways that we can connect to other people. So as we, we mature in Christ, we are learning to know Jesus. We are growing to live more like Jesus, and we're doing that with other people. And all of those things help lead us to this goal of being mature in Christ. So um, as we kind of begin to close, the band can go ahead and come up. And I, I just want to go back to this simple idea that we began with, that we want to go all in for Jesus. That there's a million things that you could spend your life going all in for, but the one that matters most, the one that is most worth your time and your energy and your effort is Jesus. That he is the one who will lead you into all salvation. He is the one who will change you and give you real power to overcome what is in your life. That he is the one who will change everything about how you live. And so we want to go all in for Jesus and we want to know God better and better because here's the, here's the point. As we think about what it means to be mature in Christ, like, like I can give you a bunch of things that you could do, right? Like you could, you could get in a group or you could just start reading your, your Bible or you could, uh, I don't know, spend time in prayer or you could do all these things. But it's not about doing those things. We do those things because we love Jesus, not the other way around. That, that, that you can try and you can, you can add all these things to your life, but if you don't love Jesus, none of it is going to be meaningful. And if you do love Jesus, then you're just going to naturally do those things. They're going to flow out of what you already believe about God and believe about Jesus. And so as we close, I just want to encourage you, go all in for Jesus. He is the one who matters. He is the one who is worth it and worthy. And so what I want to do is I want to just read for you about this Jesus that we're going all in for. Colossians chapter 1, in, right in the middle of it, we kind of skipped over this, but there is this incredible poem about the person of Jesus. And so I'm going to read that poem for us this morning. And as I do that, I want you to, refl want you to reflect on your relationship with God. I want you to reflect on whether or not you have come to maturity in your relationship with God or where you can continue to grow in that. And I want you to think about well, where can I go all in for Jesus? How can I jump in for Jesus? You know, at the beginning we talked about the pool and, and kind of getting into the pool. And if you jump straight in, there's always a risk involved. There's a risk that it's going to be really cold or there's going to be some kind of bacteria or something. I don't know. But there's a risk involved, and there's a risk in jumping all in for Jesus. But I promise you from Scripture that it is worth it, and you will find it to be worth it in your life. So if you guys would, let's stand, and I'm going to read this passage over you. And as I do that, reflect on you going all in with Jesus. And when I'm done, the band's going to sing, and, and we're going to have people up front ready to pray for you. And if you want to go all in, if you've maybe never decided to do that, then I encourage you to come forward and go all in for Jesus. Take that plunge for him. 
Or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and there's just one area or a few areas where you feel like you're still holding on to and you want to go all in. And I encourage you to come forward and we'll pray with you through that. So let's jump in. Let's go all in for Jesus. This is the Jesus that we're going all in for. Christ, Jesus Christ, is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and he is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities, and the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, because God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him, through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This morning, let's go all in for that Jesus. If God's leading you, come forward.